Hello, celebrity gossip enthusiasts. I'm Us Weekly's entertainment director, Travis Cronin, and you're listening to Us Weekly's Hot Hollywood Podcast. The show where we break down all of the hottest celebrity news, dramas, and other things that are just notable for you to be learned and, you know, just to speak with your next cocktail party about because you're like, oh, I'm up on all the hottest gossip. Speaking of up on all the hottest gossip, I have two amazing co-hosts who are just waist deep in all of this celebrity mess and news and nonsense. Gwen, straight hair, looking gorgeous today. Hello, Gwen Flamberg. Oh, thank you, Travis. You know, I do feel like I uh, just know more celebrity facts when my hair is straight. I do. It shows. And the lady who could write at least 11 books on celebrity gossip for the last 20 years, that is scalding hot tea, baby girl, baby woman, Sarah Heron. Hi, Trav, the girl who maybe knows a little more about celebrities when she's had a mimosa at the office. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is absolutely true. I love Sarah here on two mimosas deep. She is just my just, just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's very on brand. One, two, well, counting. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens by the end of this episode. Well, we have so much wild news today. We have someone calling uh, another celebrity the rudest celebrity they've ever met which you don't hear that often, and I just love to see it. We have an A-list couple battling over Rosé. We have a honeymoon. We have wild book revelations against royals and much, much more. Before we get into those, let us just take a moment to spotlight a story that just really made us feel weird, made us feel wild. Uh, You know, however, it just stood out to us. Glenn Flamberg, what story made you go, whoa, this week? You know, Trav, something came out this week that was just very unusual, and it involves one of my fashion style, beauty, everything icons. Of course, I'm talking about Kate Moss, because Kate Moss is always a good idea. Kate Moss revealed on a BBC show that when she did that Calvin Klein And back in 1992, you know, the one with Mark Wahlberg where she was sort of facing him and she was topless. You could see her little nipples. She said that she felt scared, vulnerable. And, you know, what was so wild about this story is that Kate Moss has never really said anything, (laughs) you know, until she testified at the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial when she so graciously came clean about you know, her experience with Johnny, that he had never pushed her downstairs. Now you just can't stop her talking. She's telling us everything. I want to hear what she has to say next. But basically she said that when she did that ad, Mark Wahlberg was sort of like very, quote, macho. He has admitted to being rough around the edges at that point in his life. And she was, you know, as she says, quote, just the model. That was really her first big ad. It's what put her on the map right after she was discovered. She ushered in the era of the waif model. So, you know, I can understand now that she felt that way, but I don't think that anybody has ever like heard about chinks in Kate Moss's fame armor. So I, I, it made me go well. I agree. And how was she? Dur- how old was she during that um, <laughs> uh, campaign? I believe she was seven. Oh, okay. I thought she was much, much younger. So that's great. We can get down with that. Yeah. Please, please never be quiet. Never be quiet, Kate Boss. You have found your voice. Speak it again. Sarah Huron, is yours about a supermodel? Is your woe of the week about a supermodel as well? Maybe, just maybe. He might not be a supermodel, but he did dabble in modeling. I also want to give a quick shout out to Adrena Patrish's book, since we were going to talk about another book later. Some interesting tea in that one, my latest celebrity read. Um, she almost dated Leonardo DiCaprio. He like hit on her hard um, in that. Vegas. And Kevin Connolly hit on her hard. She, Chris, she dated Chris Pine. She dated Chase Crawford. Like a lot of name dropping and choices by Adrena Patrish. So if you're looking for a beach read, um, I recommend Us Weekly's revelations from Adrena's book um, for <laughs> <laughs> but my woe goes to Tyler Cameron and Matt James. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Tyler in San Francisco over the weekend. And it just so happened it was right when all this was going on about the rumors about him and Matt James no longer being friends. And in case you didn't know, Matt and Tyler met in college back in like 2012. They were friends long before Tyler was on The Bachelorette. Um, and Tyler starred him on The Bachelorette and best friendship with Matt James is what made Matt James the eventual bachelor. And 
they're really close, live together in New York City. And Matt has obviously been with Rachel since his season of the show last year on and off, but going very strong as of late. And people have noticed that Tyler and Matt like don't really see each other that much or they're not photographed together that often. And they used to be like inseparable. And there was rumors that it was because of Rachel because on Watch What Happens Live a couple months ago, Matt described their relationship as love-hate, Tyler and Rachel's. So I asked Tyler about Rachel and he said that at the time when they were all kind of living together in New York, he was going through his own shit. We all have our own ways of clash. We have, we just have our own ways of clashing. I don't like listening to people sometimes and she's strong and has good opinions on a lot of things. And sometimes I just don't want to hear it. They're very happy, but I think we clash because we're passionate people and what we believe in, but we've also learned from each other. So that's good. They're good for each other. They keep each other happy. Yada, yada. But he used the word clash several times. So implying that I don't think Matt James and um, I don't think Rachel Kirkconnell and Tyler came and get along too well. Well, we know, you know, a hoe can break up the bros. Oh, yes. That should be my lead, Gwen. (laughs) That should definitely be the lead. Please (laughs) go uh, fix it now. Yes. Um, It sounds like he was having issues and she tried to give him help and he didn't like that. What did you take? What was the subtext here? Okay. I kind of think that yet yeah, Tyler was single this time last year, Tyler was dating Camilla Kendra and then that relationship ended kind of abruptly. So I think maybe Rachel was like giving like kind of mad, like giving him relationship advice or like telling him what to do when Tyler was like, no, or like in his singleness was maybe being a little bit of an F boy and didn't want Matt to be part of that <sighs> because they were okay. in a stable relationship and Tyler was single again. Or, you know, some people were saying, you know, we clashed because we have strong opinions. Could that be like a political thing? Oh, yeah, perhaps. But he did, Tyler did say a few times, you know, we get older, people are in relationships or they're not. And like, you see your friends and you see them like, we're good. Um, But he didn't know his friend was running the London Marathon. I had to inform him of that because Matt James told me, but didn't tell Tyler Cameron. So take that as what you will with that piping hot tea. Wow. (laughs) Tyler didn't run the marathon, but he was supposed to, right? In San Francisco. Yeah, I thought he was running it, but he wasn't. He was there to support the degree had like three runners running um, and he like, trained them oh nice well yeah we met him after he had run the new york marathon oh did you yes because our friend andy dorfman ran the new york marathon that year and there was a little party for her um of course and yes and 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 tyler was there and all i have to say is that even after running what is it 26.2 miles Mm -hmm. 24.2 miles i'm not quite sure but he still looked smoking hot he may be one of the prettiest people to be um if you have ever have the pleasure of being in his company you are it's it's quite striking yeah. he looks better in person doesn't he he's so much taller yeah he's quite um, tall his hand the handshake okay. i was quite shook <laughs> <laughs> well god this is a uh, tyler c appreciation <laughs> podcast today well, mine is not about any of those people at all. Um, mine is about uh, what I'm buzzing about is sort of the gift of giving a goat. I saw it on Real Housewives of Dubai season one. And now uh, Kevin Hart has gifted Chris Rock a goat. Uh, this was a symbol for greatest all, oh, greatest of all time. They are touring right now uh, at a comedy show. And Kevin Hart gave Chris Rock this goat and he named it Will Smith, which seemed a little shady at their Madison Square Garden show. Um, The audience broke out in laughter when he did this. um, And (laughs) Kevin Hart said, the goat took a shit on stage. Um, It wasn't planned either. That's the one thing I didn't think about. I was going to come up and do this tight two minutes. But instead, I gave him a goat and he destroyed Chris's shoes because he pooped on them. Chris had on some moon boot shoots and that goat got him. I I just thought this was amazing. I mean, giving someone a live goat is very Real Housewives of Dubai. And I guess it's just trending. So when you go to your next dinner party, forgo that bottle of wine or bouquet of flowers and please just bring them a goat because it seems to be what all the stars in Hollywood are doing. And feel free to name it Will Smith if you really want to be on brand. All right. Well, let us jump into some of the news for the week. Now, Sarah Huron, tell us what happens when a lesbian TikTok star and a full house, um, very Christian, seemingly lovely lady uh, meet on a dance show. Wow. Um, This is one of my favorite stories in a while. I love an unexpected celebrity feud. I love a TikTok trend. 
in case you miss it, missed it right now on TikTok, it's very popular for celebrities to do this um, quick flash to the camera where there's different prompts and it's rudest celebrity you've ever met, nicest celebrity you've ever met, like celebrity crush. And you flash it to the camera really quick. So people have to pause the video or try to screenshot it and see who you're showing. And people do it pretty fast. Jojo Siwa made it possible for people to pause her <laughs> rudest celebrity and she had picked miss candace cameron beret dj tanner herself and this video blew up over the weekend and everyone was like what did dj tanner do to jojo siwa and candace cameron beret as she does she doesn't really let things go like she's a she's a clap back she's an addresser she likes a cryptic bible yeah. verse so after we got the cryptic bible verse as expected she took to instagram and she posted a very lengthy video revealing that she had her manager call jojo siwa's manager to get candace and jojo on the phone to rectify this rudest celebrity ever comment to quote stephanie tanner how rude, how rude. and candace cameron said they had met one time um in 2019 on the kelly clarkson show and they had had a lovely interaction, according to Candace Cameron Bure. So she asked JoJo what happened. And JoJo was like, oh, no, it wasn't from the Kelly Clarkson show. When I was 11 years old, I met you at the Fuller House premiere. And I asked you to take a picture. And you said, not right now. And Candace Cameron Bure said, quote, I broke your 11-year-old heart. Ugh, I feel so crummy. JoJo, I'm so sorry. And like apologized. To, and then also gave like a PSA. Like, you guys, no matter how many followers you are, like what you put on TikTok can like go viral and like hurt people's feelings. But JoJo and Candace have allegedly made amends um, after this Fuller House snafu. Um, I just find it crazy that like Candace Cameron Bure like felt so compelled to track down JoJo Siwa's team for them to make amends. Like, I feel like you just let this one go. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't have let it go. JoJo Siwa said it was the rudest celebrity, you know, she's ever met if I was Candace. You know, I would want to address this because then everyone's going to think she is horrible to everybody. And, you know, celebrities get asked for pictures so much. Sometimes they're busy. Uh, does this seem like the rudest thing? A, if it, this is the rudest thing a celebrity has done to you, you're doing great, JoJo Siwa, because we have different stories. <laughs> do you think that that's a real story or do you think Jojo Siwa just didn't want to tell Candace Cameron Bray what really happened. I think it's, I think it's real. Okay. Um, it's just, it's, it's really wild. I mean, if that really, that is the rudest a celebrity has been to you. I mean, like not right now, like maybe later that I, I, I guess I've just had so, so much worse. Same, well, same. I could name much more weird interactions with celebrities. <laughs> Right. All right. Well, let's go on. Let's get a little bit more A-list. Uh, Gwen, the divorce of Angelina and Brad and the fight over the Miraval French Chateau where they got married is it's going to be going on until probably past both of their lives. I think they will have passed. We will have passed. And this fight will still be going on. It's really something because I, I honestly like don't even really 100% understand why they're still fighting over this. So Angelina and Brad got married at Chateau Miraval in 2014. It was a backdrop for their fairy tale wedding, but things turned ugly in 2019 when they had their, um, to say falling out is um, putting it real mildly. <laughs> But basically, with the Chateau Miraval, which is a rosé vineyard, I'm sure you guys have all had some of that rosé. It's fabulous. If Sarah Heron wasn't drinking mimosas right now, she might be drinking Chateau Miraval yes. whilst yeah. recording. But here's the thing. Angelina sold her stake in Miraval to the Stoli Browns. Stoli is the parent company of their wine arm. It's like two to tell Mons, owned by an oligarch. Now, Brad doesn't want them to have it. He wants to wholly own Miraval so that the children, all bajillion of them, will one day inherit the land, which I understand. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's, you know, a bajillion hectares. It's a very big property. It's very notable. It makes beautiful wine. It can be profitable for eons to come. But Angelina doesn't want him to buy out the Stoli people. So she petitioned Brad for some documents and a judge ruled this week that Brad had to hand them over and he can't even appeal this. Why? Why so acrimonious? Why can't they just get to a decision about the godforsaken vineyard so that everyone can enjoy the rosé and have good feelings about it? There is so much hatred there. In fact, sources tell us that it's Brad's extreme hatred for Angelina that is fueling all of this. 
Ooh. Yeah, we had sources tell us that it's Brad's hatred for her. But we also had a source close to Brad tell us that he didn't want to sell to Stoli because he has a problem with the oligarch who owns yeah. Stoli and that she didn't even give him an opportunity to match the money and that they're both doing this for super vindictive reasons. They're both super stubborn. And I think it's wild that Stoli tried to buy it. Brad was like, absolutely not. And Angelina's like, actually, Stoli will be buying this. When obviously Brad could have coughed up however tens of millions of dollars they wanted for her half of Miraval. Right. Messy. It is real messy. Honestly, like, imagine having so much money that, like, you guys, like, fighting over a winery gets to, like, be your, like, gotcha. Like, I'm going to sell it out from under you. And, like, kind of, kind of chic. It's like War of the Roses or yes. Dare I Say War of the Rose. It is War of the Rose. Gwen, really you're a wordsmith today. <laughs> <laughs> you really are. Most couples put over, like, I don't know, a dining room table and they right. have like a chateau vineyard in the south of France. Kind of the dream. Kind of the dream. Well, he can't appeal it. So we'll see what goes on there. Maybe these two kids will make up. I'm just kidding. There's absolutely no way they're ever making up. It went real, real bad. Well, let's move on to a celebrity couple who has made up and are doing super, super great, you guys. It is Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. Jenjamin, as I'm calling this time around. Well, JLo and her butt and her hub- hubbies are in Paris and they are just having the chicest time. Some of the kids are there and they are walking around the Louvre, cruising down the scene. They're in the Hardines on the Champs de Lisee. They're in all of these. I speak Spanish, not French. Uh, so they and they are staying at the Hotel de Crillion? They're at the Creon. They're at the Creon, which is only the most fabulous gilding and crystal hotel that there is. Yes. And what I love about the Creon, which I know now know how to say, is that uh, King Louis the 16th and Queen Marie Antoinette, I know you've heard of her, um, were holed up there right before being guillotined during the French Revolution. Um, and it became a hotel in 1901. They also went to some of the most fabulous restaurants in Paris. They went to the Lulu Giraffe, which seems to be I the love one Lulu. that. Lulu Giraffe is cool too. Giraffe is the best yeah. view of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. That's and then like and no one can get a reservation there. Yes. Oh well, that is great. I think it's fascinating, Um, like to figure out like which kids were there because isn't it like only the daughters? I thought I I saw Max and Emmy, but did I just did I just see? There was definitely some Affleck girls. I don't know if Samuel was there though. Oh, see, it's always hard to to photograph those. I know. Like kids. I don't think Samuel was there, but it seems like all the other kids were there. Maybe only one of J Lo's twins. It, it's super, super hard to tell, and we don't publish photos of kids right, unless we don't. it's at like a super public event. But I like, I read the Daily pub- Mail, you know. But guys, <laughs> you know what we do publish? We do publish the really pretty dresses that J Lo has been wearing all through her honeymoon, two of which, guys, are under $300. Oh so God. go to usmagazine.com slash stylish, wow. and you can see every look that J Lo has worn on the Paris honeymoon including exactly what they are in radio. You know what else we published? Those photos of Ben Affleck sleeping on that yacht on the honeymoon, which has been the highlight for me personally. Mm-hmm. It's been the best photo I've ever seen. If you haven't looked at them, he is just, he is tuckered out from Las Vegas and Paris, and he is just adorable in that he's little like, nap he's having. He, this Benifer, like, press tour, he's, he's, he's too old for this. He can't handle this round. He really is. Well, if anyone has any up and coming trips to Paris, go to usmagazine.com to check out everywhere they went. And if anyone needs any cute dresses, usmagazine.com slash Silas to see what they all wore because they are really doing Paris great. And, you know, some of are just like us, but they have way more money and access. So good luck. Good luck to all of us trying to get a reservation at Giraffe where mm-hmm. JLo celebrated her 53rd birthday with him. But it's fun for aspiration and the pictures are lovely. Well, across the way, all the way in California, we have an update on the other Jen, the scorn Jen. No, she's she's doing all right. Jen Garner and the Burger King, known as John Miller. We got a source update from the two of them. Now, they are very, very private, but Jen and the Burger King, I'll start calling John Miller. Jen Garner and John Miller um, meet each other's houses. They escape the paparazzi while doing this. It's apparently, apparently very intentional, the source tells us. They meet for a quick glass of wine here and there and low-key dinner night. 
all of their family, all of their families have met, the source tells us. She has met and hung out with John's kids, his whole family for special events like birthdays where they've all gotten together. So the family has families have been getting quite close and the two are incorporating their families. Uh, the source also says that John Miller, the Burger King, has been spending more time with Jen's kids and they do fun things together on the weekends. They also read each other love notes when they're away from each other, which I thought was adorable. And just to give us a little more information on John Miller, the Burger King, the source says that John is a romantic, but an unapologetic workaholic as well. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we don't hear anything about them. We hear that they might be engaged, maybe not. Uh, it seems like they are not for now, but they're integrating the families and spending a lot of time together. So I'm just, you know, here for Jennifer Garner having a good time too, because her ex is in the most high profile relationship in the entire world. Yeah, my official statement, I just only want good things for Jennifer Gardner and nothing will ever change that. And if the Burger King is making her happy, then like flip them on the patties. Let's go. Totally. Get it in between those buns, Jen. We are happy for you. Well, let us talk about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Now, a lot of people have chopped crap about this couple, including everybody on this podcast. But someone is really putting the pen to ink. There is a new explosive book about them. Have you guys heard the name of this book? Because it is already salacious in the title. It is called Revenge. And there are tons of huge revelations um, of of what happened during their time in the palace, outside of the palace. And we're going to hit you with some of the revelations. This book is even out yet, but the author, Mr. Bauer, is doing a little tour and giving us sneak peeks. Now, he says that Harry and Meghan were, quote, addicted to reading about themselves in the press and were worried their secrets were getting out through their famous friends. They said that, um, the author says that every night they scoured the internet and read the newspaper reports and the trolls postings on social media. Irrationally, they grouped the two together and fed each other's frenzy about the media. They were convinced that as champions of goodness, they were being persecuted um, (laughs) um, and, you know, targeted because of racism. And they felt victimized by the mildest criticism. Now, this creeped out. It wasn't just trolls on the internet. The The book claims that Meghan and Harry, quote, suspected Victoria Beckham of indiscretion. Harry called David Beckham to repeat this accusation and outraged David Beckham's uh, truthful denials damaged their reputation. Now, they thought that Victoria and David Beckham were, of course, members of their wedding. I don't know if there was the Spice Girls leak or details about the letting or why you thought Victoria Beckham was leaking things about you, but... Apparently, it is ruined Prince Harry and David Beckham's relationship. There are also the accusations of bullying that come up again against Meghan Markle to several of the staffers in the palace. And of course, the infamous pre-wedding disagreement with Kate Middleton that made headlines at the time where Meghan accused uh, Kate of making her burst into tears. Now, the biographer said it was actually the other way around and the Kate Middleton was crying because of Charlotte's dress. We don't quite get the full story, but it's going to be in the book, Revenge. Um, and the that they the BBC said that they were informed that Harry and Meghan never asked permission to use the Queen's nickname to name their daughter Lilibet. These are just my top favorite revelations about this book, but it is wild. It's sort of things we've heard before, but with a lot more explosive details, and it's not looking good for the Sussexes. <laughs> no, listen, I mean, any book called Revenge, Meghan, Harry, and the War Between the Windsors, <sighs> Um, I think we might be going in with a bias here and you know I'm not the biggest Meghan Markle Harry stan in the world but I do think you know take maybe some of these claims with a grain of salt I don't know how balanced this this book is but at the same time if you read Finding Freedom you'd think that Meghan and Harry were like the heroes that walk among us so all these royal books are biased and kind of you can tell where they lean this is clearly more these sources are more connected to the firm um, and less Harry and Meghan I think the feud with the Beckhams is fascinating I'd love to know more details on whether Victoria Beckham actually leaked stories about the Royals or if like Harry actually called David and was like, is 
posh doing this because I'm sure they were so offended. Um, but my other favorite part was the f- alleged feud between Megan and her former Suits car co-star, Sarah Rafferty. Which they definitely had a feud. I'm sure. According to this author, they had an argument um, when she left the show, which was in 18, Megan had asked their her merchandising casting agent to consider representing Sarah for commercial deals. So then when the two met and this casting agent really liked Sarah, she took her under her news. And then Megan apparently called and said, no, that's a conflict of interest. I don't want you working with my co-star and um, alleged that Megan was being manipulative and several Suits actors felt the same way. So very interesting to know if that's true. Well, I mean, I had it at the time. Obviously, can't tell you where I heard it, but I had it on very, very good authority that Megan and Sarah hated each other. And really? it was because something that Megan was doing to co-stars, but especially Sarah, they hated each other during times of the filming. And especially when she started dating Prince Harry, the feud got worse and worse. And uh, I've just heard things from on set and that that I can really attest to is something that was brewing under the surface, no matter really what happened. Um, Gwen, what do you think about this? It does seem um, Omid's book about finding freedom seemed to be very pro-Sussex. This book seems to be very pro-firm. Maybe we could put together and find some middle ground of truth. Well, you know, the good thing is that when books like this come out, another book will follow that will probably refute some of the things. Um, You know, I've been very clear about my feelings, about what I think um, Meghan Markle could have done better. Yeah, release the, keep the tig up. However, the tig. As, as, as someone who I, I do really love Queen Elizabeth, she's not getting any younger. I hate that this book might bring her some stress. Yeah, I do too. Hopefully the queen has not heard about revenge against them because she doesn't need that right now in her life. She's heard of it. She's source quoted in it. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) She's not source quoted in it. Kidding, kidding. But it is weird that if it's true that they didn't ask permission, you sort of give a heads. I mean, maybe you don't give a heads up if you're naming your daughter after your grandmother's nickname. Maybe that's sort of more of a surprise element. I don't know. I think that's probably normally okay, but like when your grandma's the Queen of England and it's going to like come out as like a press release, like maybe you throw, you let them know, especially because it was like a nickname, not just like a middle name. Right. 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 Well, it also seems like everybody in this book just hates Megan and Harry yes. so much. And anything they did, they think is uh, anything they did <clears throat> without the palace's permission is sort of rubbing salt in the wound. Um, I can't wait for Sarah Huron to read it and give us some exactly. more. I, I mean, details. personally, I really loved that they chose the name Lilibet and Same. I would imagine that the queen was touched and we had heard reporting that she was touched. So. I mean, I guess like normal families, if you're going to name somebody for somebody, like you just let them know ahead of time, I guess, but maybe not. Yeah. Well, good luck to the queen. We got God save the queen. Long live the queen. We love you. Well, let us move on to the Aquaman. Jason Momoa was involved in a head on motorcycle accident over the weekend. Uh, Luckily, he was not riding the motorcycle. Um, It was sort of a dramatic video. TMZ has it. If you haven't seen it, go look at it. It's no one's killed or injured, but it is sort of crazy. And we have a source info about Jason Momoa that he is recovering, but he is still extremely shaken up by the trauma of it all. He knows he is lucky to be alive and just grateful that he got away unscathed and the other driver is okay too. He's had an extremely turbulent time over the past couple of years uh, and various drama dramas uh, as well as his hectic career and he's trying to make the most of every day and watch out for danger at every turn. Now, did you guys see the video of this crash yet? It's sort of wild. No. no. I didn't watch it. It would freak me out. I'm so thankful that Jason Momoa is like a tank and so he was not injured. Same. He was coming around the corner. This other guy was coming around the corner. Hopefully, Isa Gonzalez was by his side, and or maybe not. I can't tell if the two of them are together. But glad he is okay. Well, I think this is the most exciting news I have heard all week. Britney Spears and Elton John are doing a duet? Question mark. Well, Page Six has learned that Britney Spears and Elton John have been in the studio rec- recruiting uh, a recording, uh, a, a remix, maybe a reimagining. I don't know 
what we're going to call it, but to Tiny Dancer. Um, they met at a Beverly Hills recording studio last week to do a new take on his beloved 1971 classic. The track is set to be released by Universal Music next month, sources tell page six. And the sources, all the source also said this was Elton's idea, and Britney is a huge fan. They have recorded the remix of Tiny Dancer as a full duet, and it is quote incredible. Britney was there in the studio last week at the super secret recording session overseen by producer Andrew Watt. Uh, they've already played it for people at the record label, the source says, and everybody's freaking out. It is so good. And they are saying this is going to be the song of the summer. Well, the song of the summer is already Lizzo's about damn time and yeah. summer is coming to an end. So I don't know if I'd agree with that, but maybe the song of the fall. I don't know. This is just so exciting that Britney is getting back to recording and that she is working with A-listers because throughout her career, because of how you know guarded she was against people, she couldn't really collab or be friends with too many celebrities. I know she loves Drew Barrymore and Madonna and all of them showed up, but it's not like they have dinner together all the time. They're sort of just like, you know, sort of outlier friends. So I'm really glad that she got to meet with Elton John and they recorded this Hold Me Close Now Tiny Dancer, which I hope Britney makes even sexier because that's what she does. <laughs> Are you guys excited for this? And will it be the song of the summer? Am I wrong? I don't think it'll be the song of the summer because I also think that it's like a little late to drop the song of the summer. Yeah. Um, but I am excited for that. And I love the Dua Lipa, um, Elton John, Cold Cold Heart remix. Like same. that's a, that's a big one for me. So I'm feeling that that'll have that same vibe. And that I love a remix of an older song, like with a pop twist and a pop star. Well, most pop songs are so great. Gwen, what do you think about it? Not much. <laughs> How do you, you don't you don't care about Britney getting back to the studio? I I'm just I can't get over Britney feuding with her mom on Instagram and Britney uh. just being so out there and like posing naked and posing topless and it's just too much for me. And you know you guys know that I was like the de facto president of the Free Britney Club, but I, I just. Yes. I don't know. I, I maybe new music will change it. Maybe a collab with an icon, two icons together will change it. I just, you know, now that she has the conservatorship has ended and she has a bit more freedom, that doesn't mean you have the freedom to just spew it all, Brittany. Hold back a little bit and stop fighting with your mom so publicly. We know she's soft. Uh, yeah, Britney Spears posted on Instagram yesterday. Uh, she was talking about the conservatorship again and her mom, Lynn's part in it. She said, quote, you abused me. Uh, Lynn Spears has kept quiet around these accusations. Uh, but Britney just sort of seemingly out of nowhere, perhaps it was somewhere, just blasted her and the rest of her family, claiming that they perpetuated and profited from the legal arrangement that Britney's dad had with them. She had lots of very specifics. You were in my beach house when I wasn't allowed to leave my house. Um, she claimed her mom wouldn't text her back, um, giving the medication oh, against yeah. her will. I mean, it is really, really wild. And of course, it's hard to read, um, but there was this, there's this one girl on TikTok who does a Louisiana accent of reading Britney's Instagrams. And I swear they make so much more sense when she reads it in the Louisiana accent without any periods or punctuation. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a little worried for it too. But I mean, she's cooped up for 13 years. She's finally found her voice. She is looking for nipples, booty crack and revenge. And I think that is, she is finding that in social media. Well, we will see what happens. Hopefully she blasts her family in the Tiny Dancer song because I could go for an artistic read of her family in an iconic pop song with Sir Elton John. Well, that is all the time we have today. Um, feel free to go on Instagram and blast your parents and post a nude picture or a thong if you have been in conservatorship for 13 weeks, 13 years. And thank you to my host, Gwen and Sarah, for helping me spill all of this piping hot celebrity this week. Again, this is Travis Corden and us Weekly's Hot Hollywood Podcast with your weekly peek into the glamour, glitter, fashion, and fame of your favorite celebrities. After all, they're, celebrities they're just, are just like, like us. us. And they want revenge. <laughs> okay, great. And Sarah has finished her first mimosa. Go grab another one. And we will be back next week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Bye. <laughs>